Hello, good friends. This is the fifth in a series about linguistics. And the first ones, we talked about things like symbols. A symbol is a structure that has a form linked to a meaning. The form is prototypically a speech sound, but it could be something else like a written signal or a hand gesture. However, we talk about phonological structures and generally what we mean then is a significant structure that is linked to a meaning and can bring that meaning to mind. Languages are made of symbols. The second video had to do with whether linguistics is a science. And the answer we came up with was that it depends on how you define science. If you require that for a science you have to make absolute plus or minus statements, you have to say things that are 100% predictions that cannot be any way other than the way that you said they're going to be, linguistics doesn't work that way. You leave out too much stuff that is not only interesting but of the very nature of language if you require that. There is not a dichotomy between things that are predictable and things that are arbitrary. There is a whole range of structures in human cognition and in human language that is reasonable or is understandable to some extent without being predictable. You can be less surprised that people would do B and more surprised that they would do A without saying either that A is absolutely necessary or that B is totally arbitrary. On the third and fourth videos together covered the topic of how you define a language. We used a definition that says that a language is a structured inventory of conventionalized linguistic units. Linguistic is defined to be symbolic, to have forms and meanings linked together. A structure is linguistic to the extent that it is a form that has a meaning or a meaning that is linked to a form or is a symbol composed of a meaning together with a form. A unit is a habit, an established habit in a person's mind. It's something the person has learned to do and has gotten in the habit of doing. A conventionalized unit is a unit that that person and others share. If a speaker uses a particular symbol, the other members of the language that she speaks will also recognize that symbol and know that that's what she is trying to say. So those are conventionalized linguistic units. Those units make up an inventory. They're not a completely predictable bunch of things, but they are in many aspects like an arbitrary pile of things. On the other hand, it's not arbitrary because it's a structured inventory. There are a number of relationships among the units that give structure to the inventory. All right then, a language is built out of symbolic structures. Let's take a look at some of the range of those structures. I'd like to concentrate on one parameter in particular, which is the parameter of complexity. There are some symbolic structures that are very simple, and there are others that are relatively complex. At the simple end, there's a natural stopping point, which is where a symbol is just plain simple. There is only one semantic structure, and there's only one phonological structure, and they are linked. What about when there's two? Are there lots of cases of that? Yes, lots and lots of cases. And what do we call things when they have more than one? When they just have one meaning and one sound that symbolizes that meaning, we call them morphemes. And morphemes are then the simplest symbols. When you have more than one morpheme involved in a symbolic structure, we tend to call those constructions. And that makes sense because you are constructing, you're putting structures with each other. One definition that a good many people use of the word grammar is that morphemes are not grammatical structures, but anything that is a construction is a grammatical structure. There is a grammar, a rules for how the things go together. That's a useful way to talk, though it's not the only way to talk about what grammar means. We've already seen one meaning of grammar, which is all of the structures in a language. Well, this would be all of the complex structures in a language. When you move away from morphemes, you get into complex stems, words, phrases, clauses, and sentences, and paragraphs, and sections, and discourses, and there's no clear upper limit to how complex things can get. Generally, when you have something more and more complex, you tend to think of it in terms of a discourse including other discourses or something of that sort. 
but it is very clear that at the morpheme end you, you have relatively simple structures and at the discourse end you have very complex structures and there's a whole gradation in between. I'd like to clarify two things about this gradation of complexity. The first is that we're representing averages or tendencies or something like that. Each one of these kinds of structures has a number of possibilities of how complex it can be. It is not the case that a word is always more simple than a phrase, or that a phrase is always more simple than a clause, or so forth. It is quite possible to find clauses enclosed within phrases, so the phrase includes all the complexity of the clause and then some. You can even find words that are made out of phrases. So the order in which I have put these things is more a tendency in how they go, not necessarily the way they always will be. And that's important to remember. The second thing is that we're talking about levels of complexity. This becomes important because a lot of structures are schemas or patterns. As you get into the higher structures, you find very abstract patterns, but they can be quite simple. So we have listed discourses, for instance, as the most complex kind of structure, but it's quite possible to have a discourse schema or pattern or rule that says something like, put an introduction and follow it with the body of your argument and then have a conclusion. And that's very simple. Now, by the time that pattern gets translated into actual words and actual morphemes, you're likely to have a very complex structure that's the discourse. But that whole complex structure won't be part of the English language in the same sense that the pattern was. So just remember that when we say that one kind of structure is more complex than another, we're talking about level of complexity. A discourse pattern or a paragraph pattern may be very simple in and of itself, but its structure is still at a high level of complexity because it can include many sentences, and each sentence can contain a number of clauses, and the clauses can contain phrases and on down, all the way down to single morphemes. So let's look at that a little bit. The first issue that comes up is that you have to distinguish between unipolar and bipolar complexity. When we define a morpheme as the simplest symbolic structure, that doesn't mean that its meaning or that its phonology are necessarily simple. Think of a word like hippopotamus. Does it have pieces? Well, not for most speakers. They just know the whole thing means this animal that lives in Africa and it is very big and they may realize it lives in water most of the time and they have a picture in their mind of how its face looks. Lots of specifications of what the animal is. And the phonology of the thing is quite complex. Hippopotamus, five syllables. It's not a simple phonological structure and it's not a simple meaning structure. But the linkage between them is simple. It's a morpheme. To take a second example from Africa, what about the word sphinx? Think about its sound. It's got an SF at the beginning and this inks. It's all one syllable, but it's quite a syllable. That's pretty hard to pronounce. Try and get somebody who doesn't speak English to pronounce it even. And what does this mean? We'll talk some other time about definitions and how you arrive at them, but for now let me tell you what comes to my mind when I hear that word or what I'm likely to be trying to communicate if I say it. A sphinx is a mythical creature often represented in sculptures and in statues. It's especially associated with Egypt where it often takes the form of an animal's body, often a lion's body, with a human head and the human head is generally that of a pharaoh or something like that. And sphinxes were often guarding the entrance to palaces or other important places. They had the unpleasant habit of asking people riddles and if the people could not answer the riddles, eating them. So that's what a sphinx is. Now, when that comes together, this complex sound and this complex meaning, it's not the case that part of the sound represents part of the meaning and another part of the sound represents another part of the meaning. It's not the case that the SF means, oh, it's got a lion-shaped body, and that the inks means something about riddles. That's not the way it is. It's all of the meaning package comes together with all of the phonological package. So it's a morpheme. Let's contrast two words. These are from Mexican Spanish. One of them is the word Popocatépetl which is a slight mispronunciation of a Nahuatl word, but it's the name of a volcano. It's a big volcano that's outside Mexico City and very beautiful mountain, very high mountain. It's the second highest point between Alaska and South America, in fact. 
the phonology of this is quite difficult and it ends with a TL sound which you don't get in normal Spanish. It's not the case that for most Spanish speakers the different parts of that sound correspond to different parts of the meaning. They do in Nahuatl where the word comes from, but that's a different issue. For Spanish speakers, the whole thing means the whole mountain. Contrast that with a word like tumbaburros. Popocatepetl has five syllables. Tumbaburros only has four. And Popocatepetl has this funny TL sound. On the other hand, tumbaburros has meaningful pieces all over the place. There are two main ones. There's tumba and there's burros. Tumba is a verb and it means to knock things over and burros means donkeys. But those are also complex structures because tumba is formed out of tum, which is the root, and a, which tells you what kind of verb, that it's an indicative verb, and third person singular subject. And burros has uh, got an s on it that means it's plural, and it also has an o on the end, which is a masculine ending. So all of those different pieces link up to particular parts of the meaning of tumba burros. The meaning of tumba burros doesn't come about automatically as a result of those meanings. Those meanings do contribute, however. A tumba burros is a grill work that is put in front of the radiator of a big truck. And as the truck's running down the highway, if it happens to run into a bunch of donkeys on the road, which used to happen more often than it does nowadays, it will dump them over and protect the radiator from being hurt. So it's a donkey dumper, so to speak. So all those little pieces are different morphemes. The whole comes together to form a word, tumba burros. So it's got a very complex meaning and a complex sound, but it also has complex linkages between the meaning and the sound. This shows up so clearly in the diagram in the numerous connections between the different parts of the phonology and different parts of the meaning, in the case of tumba burros, but only one connection between the whole of the phonology and the whole of the semantic structure in Popocatépetl. There's another issue that's worth mentioning, and that's that we often think of something as simple or complex in terms of how hard or how easy it is to learn. This, again, does not fit with what we're saying when we say that a morpheme is simple and that a construction is complex. If you were trying to learn Popocatépetl or Tumba Burros in Spanish for the first time, you'd have a lot harder time with Popocatépetl. Even though it's simple in its structure, there's no reason why it should be just the way it is. It's, it's arbitrary, it's weird, it's hard to learn. But tumba burros, oh, all that complexity motivates the meaning. All that complexity fits with what the meaning is. And that helps you remember it and that helps you learn it. So the complexity doesn't make it harder to learn, it makes it easier to learn. And that's typical. That, in fact, is why we make constructions, precisely so that they can give us a clue as to what the meaning is, and then we can learn the meaning that way. Or we can understand it right away without having to puzzle over it. I said a while ago that sometimes the formation of complex symbols is described by the word grammar. Another word that's sometimes used, that I just assume you learn, because I'm likely to use it without thinking, all of the complex symbols are in the area of morphosyntax. Uh, some people would use that term to exclude discourse stuff, but anyhow. Basically, morphology is the way that morphemes come together to make words, and syntax is the way that words come together to make phrases and clauses and sentences and things like that. So morphosyntax covers all of those two areas. So add the words morphosyntax and morphosyntactic to your collection. And I'm going to leave it there for today, friends. There's quite a bit more to say about this gradation of complexity. We'll get into that next time. For now, work your way through the little exercise here to make sure that the vocabulary is clear in your mind that we're talking about. And I'll see you next time.